Where are all the aliens? How about here? Dr. Richard Haynes. Hello. There are a lot of videos out there that have the basic premise of, if the universe is so full of aliens, why don't we see any? While we can understand how a science-minded person would see most of the supposed evidence as inconclusive regarding what people have seen here in the Earth's atmosphere, there is one scientist who finds that one particular type of sighting is curious enough to merit scientific study. His name is Dr. Richard Haynes. For decades, he used his expertise as a former NASA research scientist, gathering up strange reports from pilots from all over the world, totaling some 3,500 reports. Each report has its own carefully vetted witnesses, and in some cases, there was even aircraft instrument telemetry, ground and air radar corroboration, as well as witnesses on the ground. He made an even more specific study of his data that looked specifically at incidents in America that had the potential to affect air safety, and it included 100 cases from the 1950s to 1997. It was called Aviation Safety in America, a Previously Neglected Factor and was published through his partner organization called NARCAP in the year 2000. Here's a look at just a few. January 20th, 1951, Sioux City, Iowa. Captain Lawrence Vinther, 32, and F.O. James Bachmeyer were flying their Mid-Continent Airlines DC-3 from Sioux City, Iowa to Omaha, Nebraska under a moonlit sky. Just after takeoff of Flight 9 from Runway 31, the tower operator asked them if they could see a bright light visually aligned with the northwest corner of the airport from the tower's vantage. They both spotted it, a red or orange light, and changed their course slightly to the north-northwest to better see what it was. Later, Captain Vinther said that the light seemed to be about 4 miles distance at 8,000 feet altitude, perhaps 7,000 feet higher than their own altitude at that time. The airplane turned left in a slow arc, and so did the light, still well above the two-engine aircraft. They continued their left turn to near due south, and the light was now in the southeast at their 11 o'clock position when it blinked on and off several times. When the light eventually reached their 9 o'clock position, all that could be seen was a single continuous bright white, like landing light. Then, as the airplane continued a 360 degree left turn, now proceeding more northerly, the object made a sharp 90 degree turn and descended towards our plane at a terrible speed, crossing over and in front of our plane, as Captain Vinther said. The next thing I knew, the object was on our left, traveling in the same direction, about 200 feet from our left wing and at the same speed. It stayed at this location for two or three seconds and then disappeared below our plane and was not seen again. The tower advised that the object was following just below our plane, but we could not maneuver our plane so as to observe it again and continued on our scheduled flight to Omaha. Both pilots saw a huge cigar-shaped fuselage pacing them. It also had a long, slender wing mounted well forward on the fuselage. No engine nacelles were seen. The unidentified object remained right beside them at their own airspeed. Vinther was in near shock and almost couldn't answer when Captain Bachmeyer asked him what it was. It was at least as large as a B-29. It had a small short stabilizer on each end. He allegedly muttered, I, I can't believe it. After a total of about three minutes, the object departed to the northwest at a tremendous speed without producing any air turbulence. One of the passengers who saw the object from his window was an Air Force colonel who asked the flight crew to radio the sighting to ground authorities. Upon their landing, they were met by several Air Force officers who interrogated them and went over their aircraft with some instruments. The official Air Force evaluation of the object was a B-36. Captain Vinther said later it definitely was not a B-36. If this huge strategic nuclear bomber can hover at low altitude over an airport and fly at very low altitudes near commercial aircraft with passengers, then the United States has had a truly marvelous weapon system indeed that never should have been phased out. Details of the control tower's visual sighting of the original object will be omitted due to space limitations. July 9th, 1951, Augusta, Georgia. Lieutenant George Kinman was flying an F-51 fighter plane over Augusta, Georgia on a sunny, clear day. He had flown for seven years, including jets, in the military at the time. He describes his close call in these words, quote, I was cruising at about 250 miles per hour when all of a sudden I noticed something ahead, closing in on me, head on. Before I could take evasive action, before I even thought of it, in fact, this thing dipped abruptly and passed underneath, just missing my propeller. The thing was definitely of disc shape, white, pretty thick. It looked like an oval. It was about twice as big as my plane. It had no visible protrusions like motors, guns, windows, smoke, or fire. Lieutenant Kinman banked rapidly to try and keep the object in sight. The object was nowhere in sight, then about 15 seconds later the disc came at him again, dipping at the last minute. 
The unidentified object repeated this maneuver several more times over the next 5 to 10 minutes. On its final pass, the object zoomed upward instead of down, just missing his canopy. August 27, 1951, Vandalia, Illinois. Private pilot Raymond Williams had just taxied out onto the runway to take off for a night flight around the city when he spotted a big orange light with a blinding intensity. It was then at the southwest corner of the airport. After he radioed CAA officials in the tower, the light disappeared. Later, he wrote, quote, Shortly after I had taken off, I noticed the light again approaching my plane. It came directly at me and then circled my plane twice before heading for Greenville. I followed it and it made a circle around that town and came back towards Vandalia. A commercial flight flying at 20,000 feet over Vandalia at the time was contacted and said he too saw the object. It was all very spooky, Williams said. It wasn't an airplane, but whatever it was, the light was on the tail of it, and there was a small red light on top. Probably it was some military craft from Scott Field making a test run. The Air Force did not investigate the case further, but relied upon several newspaper articles. Check the link in the description to see more, and to read the report yourself. Haynes is always careful not to conclude that it is indeed aliens that are responsible for the strange sightings. However, he does elaborate how so many of the incidents have an apparent intelligence behind their interactions with the aircraft. Well, he said, no matter what I did with that aircraft, they stayed with the aircraft perfectly aligned. It was called station keeping. So he said, after a while of this, we're running out of fuel and I have a job to do. He said he added power, got back up to cruise altitude, and, and put it on back on autopilot. And he said after 15 or so minutes more, the objects departed from the aircraft in the exact opposite order they, they arrived. Intelligence. To me, that's, that's not random. So yet, even in the face of an exhaustive study of these types of events, his colleagues in the scientific community don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole, as the saying goes. From a science point of view, I can't ignore the data. The phenomena is just so beautiful, so powerful, so curious, that it demands some scientific involvement. Now I can understand why, as there is no way to demonstrate that it is indeed an extraterrestrial phenomenon. Yet if it were, it would be by its very nature very unlikely to be able to conclusively demonstrate that it is. To give an analogy by anecdote, the tribes of Papua regarded the airplanes that flew over them for years as gods, until finally one crash landed and they were able to confirm that it was indeed just humans aboard the strange craft. One could see how this may have stayed an impossible thing to confirm if there was never a chance to really see who was controlling them. Human-made aircraft leave essentially no physical evidence behind to be examined. So short of following them to the airport, if you had no way of collecting evidence, it would be impossible to conclude one way or the other what planet the pilots came from. It is indeed a big jump to conclude that they are from another planet, but it is less of a jump to propose that they are likely not humans, as they don't seem to exhibit any sign of known human technology. This is especially true of the observed phenomenon from the 1950s, and indeed even further back in history. Another thing I often think. As scientists are looking out in the universe for a radio signal as a way of confirming extraterrestrial life, perhaps the civilizations by majority are way beyond radio in their evolution. Look at the development of radio, for example, in the spectrum of intelligence in just the Milky Way. The more advanced civilization thinks using radio is something like one rung on the ladder above self-awareness. Can only imagine what considerations about those types of relatively early technologies we might have about ourselves, given just one million more years at our current evolutionary rate. Wondering why we don't get radio signals may be similar to saying, why don't they just come down here and shout at us? We seem to think we are interesting enough to be communicated with, yet what if we aren't so interesting? Like a toddler who has soiled itself, it may not be the best source of conversation even if we are kind of adorable. If you like this video, check out and maybe subscribe to our other channel here. It's about mysteries and strange news. Thanks for watching.